Right. As Maury mentioned, I'm, my name is Mike Brost. I've been with Aviva, uh, Wonderwear, Invensa, Schneider, CB, I don't know, whatever our parent company name is for the last 26 <laughs> years. Uh, been around a long time in this the thing. So what we're going to talk about is how do I, what's a, how do I design a system for defensible security, right? You know, all the stuff sits up above, right? You know, but I'm in this OT land, right? I, I have to make this thing secure. That's really my area of influence, right? I, you know, I rely on other people in the organization to properly build a firewall and all this other stuff that's involved, but I got to make my system uh, secure. So, right. So one of the basic requirements that we look at in a defensible control system is you have to be able to secure the system at the destination of your commands. You can't be reliant on a graphic or some arbitrary access point to have that security arbitration there. It's got to be where the things are writing to, right? So everything that's in the system, right? And I don't care what you want to call it, whether it's a tag, an item, an attribute, an element, right? The thing that we're writing to should evaluate, are you allowed to write to me? You shouldn't be saying, am I allowed to write to that? You That should be saying, are you allowed to write to me, right? And we talk about the uh, these four A's, right? It's so you know, you need to be authenticated. In other words, you need to establish yourself as a valid user in the system, right? We know who you are now. You should be authorized to do something. You should, uh, <clears throat> and you should also that, that, so that user now is permitted to execute the right. And sometimes should the right target should be able to demand that you re-authenticate yourself, prove you're really you and not just the person who logged into the workstation and went to the went went to get coffee in the break room, right? Prove you're you, right? That action may need to be approved by someone, right? Not only are you authorized to do it, but you may have something that's critical that you have to have someone else say yes. You are now. It's an appropriate time to do this, right? And everything must be archived, right? You cannot expect to implement a security model where people's actions aren't recorded. You shouldn't have to configure it. It should all be done. It should be in a write once logging mechanism that's unmodifiable. And it should be, uh, you know, 21 CFR part 11 compliant. So it records who you are and all this details about where you were and when you did it and all these things. And that shouldn't be done by the, by the, the, the cartoon that you put on the screen. It should be done by the thing you write to. Right, and everything should follow this model. Nothing should be able to bypass it. Right? If I put an OPC UA server on top of my SCADA system and try and write to it with something that doesn't know how to support these things, it should just be denied the right. Right? You can't allow this stuff to just be uh, accessible. The, the the layer must be uh, designed so that all APIs, all external clients, all graphics, all protocols, you know. You can't expect to maintain a system where there's a hundred graphics trying to write to something and you put the security model in the graphic. How are you gonna keep that up to date? Who, where is it, right? Nobody knows. And so I've changed this a little bit, you know, and, and like everything you've seen up to now is absolutely necessary, absolutely important, but let's look at it from the perspective of the control system engineer, right? What are his threat vectors? Well, his main one, it's not the Indians or the Anians or the, you know, the state actors or anybody else. It's the guy standing right next to him. He's authorized to do something and he does it at the inappropriate time, either by accident. Maybe he doesn't understand what he was supposed to do. It's confusion. He just simply did the wrong thing, right? Or he's pissed off because they didn't give him a raise or, you know, um, disapproved his vacation or whatever it is that happens, or maybe he's just, you know, malicious, right? You know, and he wants to create some damage, right? You got to protect against these things, right? The, so, you know, your primary threat is Joe, the operator, right? He's the one who's, <laughs> then, then the other thing you have to worry about is like, you have all this protection above you, but what if someone inserts software beneath the intrusion protection layer? How are you going to protect against that, right? The other ve vector that we need to worry about is not that they're bad, not that they're mean or nasty or anything, but it's who we are connected to. As an OT environment, 
I've yet to see one intelligently built where the wild and woolly internet is on is plugged in right into that OT environment. If that's your environment, that's a bad idea. But we're connected to the IT department. And that's our threat, right? We have to protect ourselves from them. <clears throat> um, there's a reliance on port restrictions is not a good policy, right? We'll talk about that a little bit. And obscurity as a security policy. This has been in the industry pervasively, right? Is that, well, it's a proprietary protocol. Nobody knows how to use it, right? That's just not the case, right? It's easy to sniff a protocol. It's easy to figure this stuff out, right? Lack of domain isolation, you know? The OT environment should be different than the IT environment. A, a user in the IT environment should not have credentials in the OT framework, right? And any open protocols, and this is where, this is kind of like the Kepware question, right? As we talk about these things, right? How do we deal with that stuff beneath the configured security model? All right, so this is my great example of authenticated actors acting inappropriately, right? You know, this guy was totally authorized to do what he did. He didn't violate any security policy, right? But on the morning of January 13th, 2018, 8.07 a.m., a guy in the command and control center on the island of Oahu issued a message to the emergency alert system that went to every cell phone, every freeway overpass sign, every radio station, every television station, every PA system in every hotel, right? It said, ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek shelter immediately. This is not a drill. He just told the entire state they had 10 minutes to live, right? And everybody's running around, where's the shelter, right? And nobody knows, you know, <laughs> right? And 38 minutes and 13 seconds later, they issued the retraction, you know? So do you think maybe that should have had a second level of authorization, kind of like the turn your key in the missile silo, you know, like the two keys in the submarine or, you know, whatever. It should have some, just, you know, this is at a high enough level of impact that not anybody should just be able to, you know, brush up against the touch screen and have this happen, right? So again, it's just, a, this is a real thing, right? You know, I couldn't ask for a better example than this. And then, we, of course, we all remember this one. This is the Colonial Pipeline thing, right? This is the business IT threat. The business system was breached with an old VPN and password. The pipeline control system was never breached in this event. But because they didn't have the ability to disconnect themselves from the business system, they had to shut the whole thing down. <clears throat> and then, you know, they paid the ransom and the FBI got part of it back. And, you know, you know, heard all the... the the, the deals, but this is just a, uh, we're so vulnerable now that we don't know what to do. We're just going to shut everything down, right? So, you know, and you see this a lot in a lot of things. I get this all the time, like ports. Well, all software needs ports to work. It doesn't work without a port. Software has to have a port to talk to another piece of software. But it's like an analogy to an office building. It's got 64,000 telephones in it. So you restrict it to only 10 phones. Great. Who's answering the phone? Who's picking up the phone? Who are you talking to? Do you really know? No, right? So yes, fewer ports will simplify configuration of firewalls and things like that. It's all a good idea, right? But reliance on ports is not a practice, right? Because everything needs ports to work. <clears throat> And it gives you a false sense of security. So certificates and things that, that, that manage who's on the other end of that call can give us a much better security profile on how this, this all functions, right? And, you know, you've heard this before. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide, but basically the whole system is, you know, never assume anything's impregnable because it's, you know, defense in depth is critical. You know, you got to monitor, you got to be vigilant, you got to do all these things, right? You know, and understand where your vulnerabilities are right, by, you know, assessments and all these things you heard about now, right, but have a single point of disconnection. You got to be able to pull the plug on the, on the external guys when, when they're, they're, they're penetrated. You got to be able to pull the plug on your IT department, right? Because there's a lot of pr industry protocols and many devices, right? We have all these things that we put in here and there's all kinds of things. And I'm not going to go through the whole list, but you can read it. There's just tons of little things that are out there. Right? Most of these things are access. If that is even available, they can restrict access or no access. But they can't determine, can I 
send the message out to tell everybody they're going to die? Or can I change the product code on the pot on the line from grape soda to cherry soda? Right? It's once you're in, you're in. And they, and they can't arbitrate at a data level. And then we can take and normalize those protocols. Right? That's the beneath the IO server kind of protocol, right? You know, then we normalize those protocols to, you know, more industrial uh, standard to industry standards. You know, here's DDE and Sweetlink and OPC DA and UA and MQTT. And there's a bunch, there's some others out there. And they're getting a little better, right? But they still can't restrict to individual data items once you give access to the whole thing. So we need a way to do that. And so um, the problem is, is that as I build these systems, there's always a business reason for someone to get to something, right? I have to be able to do something to do my job function. I got to change the product code on the bottling line from grape soda to cherry soda. Does that mean I also get to change the pressure high level alarm limit on the ammonia tank, which runs the cooling system? Hopefully not, but that's what, we've, that's what we face with, right? And, and things like write confirmation, like when I issue the write, the write demands me, that's not even thought of in these things. And the problem is, is that none of these protocols pass credentials when they issue the write. They were granted access to issue a write when they made the connection. But after that, they don't tell it who they were after that, right? So as we, as we look at this um, environment, I talk about all these different layers of stuff. And the, my, the, my blue network is my device network. And, and you really should design this thing where there's one guy who talks to that device network. And I can, I, I know who's doing it. It should be a service account, which does that. I shouldn't allow interactive logins to communicate to that device network. It should be a service account at the point of who's allowed to talk to that IO server. This is kind of addressing your question, Clarence. But um, And that network should be segmented from the process land. I shouldn't be able to get to that environment directly from my process land. <clears throat> and any operating system that's allowed to operate a comm driver like that should be denied interactive login. There's no reason to be logging into that thing. I shouldn't be able to get in and start doing stuff And so when I look at these things, right, access to a device and supervisory rights um, must be secured, right? The access should be on an as-needed basis. I should be able to differentiate between you getting to one value or you getting to another value. I shouldn't have just write and you can change anything you want. <clears throat> um, the uh, authorization may require you to verify who you are. It may also require you to have someone else up, that's a secure. They also require to have someone else verify that you're supposed to do this at this time, right? That's the turn your key in the missile silo kind of thing, right? And you gotta be concerned about the that everything should be logged and it should not be a configuration setting. I shouldn't have to configure this. Everything should be logged. If, if someone writes to anything, it should record who did it. And everybody knows that. So the you know, they know that if I do something, it's, it's going to be known that I did it, right? And that helps you with the, you know, the, the main threat there, Joe, the guy standing next to you doing something, right? And when you get into programming and modification and configuration change, we should, we should shut that off when we're not doing that sort of thing. We shouldn't allow this to just happen at any point in time. We should just control when we're allowed to do this stuff, right? So as I begin to to do this, right? And I issue some command from something, right? The user credential should be sent with the right. Who am I? I'm issuing this right in the system. It should identify who I am, right? The place I write to should authorize whether I'm allowed to write to that. It should say, yes, you can write to that. <clears throat> and the destination target may demand additional authentication or authorization to accept that right. And it should be a single point of configuration. It shouldn't be littered across all the cartoons and graphics and touch points that exist. It shouldn't be on every external protocol. It should just be on the value I'm trying to write to. That's where I should, should build the configuration, right? 
And I shouldn't have to redeploy if I need to change that. I shouldn't have to resend out my graphical user interface or when to, to enforce that. It should just take enforcement should just take take effect. Right? Because putting it all at the other side, at the origin, is can help. It's not the, 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 the graphic level security can be maybe desirable in help, help in helping guide the person and eliminating confusion and other things. Enhance the operator experience, let him know he's not supposed to do that, right? Do other things like that, but it's not a defensible security model because it's impossible to maintain. There's too many configuration points. There's too many places to, to deal with this. And it's typically implemented by a condition placed on an animation link, right? Yeah, if you touch that, check this, and check that, or whatever. Problem is somebody forgets to put the condition on their animation link, and then pff, there goes your security model, right? OK, so. And from the OT environment, we're going to talk about this more after lunch. So actually, I'm probably going to skip this because we should be sharing data uh, to the cloud. All right. So how do we do this? Right. This is sort of my baseline of requirements. Right. This is what the, our SCADA system should allow us to do. And how do we do this with System Platform? Well, the first thing is that System Platform is Im implemented that everything is secured at rest and secured in motion. So all communication between software components is encrypted with a certificate level TLS 1.2 encryption. Right? If you don't have the certificate, you can't write to anything. I don't care who you are. I don't care what your user name is. I don't care who wrote your software. Right? <clears throat> and everything gets encrypted as we move along. Right? So we manage that with a component in the system called our SMS server, which should really be called our CMS server for certificate management server, right? And it delivers out certificates, right? Now, you can tell this thing to load your own certificates, and it'll basically, you have to change them when they expire, or you can tell it just automatically generate the certificates, and then you're done, right? It'll take care of that certificate distribution for you, and it sends out two year, two year lifespan of certificates, renews them automatically, and so that they're always available for you to use. But this makes all those software components communicate under a secured environment. Now, you can turn it off. We really suggest you don't do that. But you have one machine, which is designed to be that certificate ser server. They'll automatically generate those certificates and uh, secure all your communications, right? <clears throat> so when we look at the object model of system platform, right, it's a Basically, there's a lot of permissions that exist in a development environment, so you can restrict who's allowed to do what. Like you may, here's, here's your, an integrator, you can come in here and work on my stuff, but you can't export anything. Or you, you can come in and work on my system, but you can't add another computer to my SCADA network, right? It's all kinds of security models there. And then in runtime, you have a bunch of groupings for objects, and then you can say, what you're allowed to do, right? So that there's configure, operate, and tune. Uh, configure is an interesting security setting because what it says is that when you have parameters that are related to each other, like for instance, I have scaling parameters, right? Like our scaling algorithm has six parameters. If you changed one, you wouldn't want it to evaluate the scaling parameter until you changed all six, right? So configure means that it'll pause the evaluation on that thing while you make changes to it until you're done, and then you can turn it back on again. Um, operate and tune are, are basically uh, parallel things, and they allow you to operate allows the subcategory of secured write, which means you, the user must reauthenticate themselves, and verified write, which means two different users, one with a verify write permission, right, ha has to be used to allow that to happen. So we have these seven uh, classifications here. Free access simply means any legitimately logged in user with a proper certificate can make a change to this value. Still going to record it. Still going to record who did it. Still going to do all those things. But we don't care who you are. Right? Operate means you must have operate permissions. And a subset of operate is secured right and verified right. Tune means you have tune permissions. Configure is the other one. Type. Read only just means no interactive user is ever going to write to this value. Ever. By anybody. 
right? And secured right can request additional information such as, you know, re-enter your username and password or even change the username and password. Maybe you tried to do something, you're not allowed to do it, but you know, someone else is and they can they can put their username and password in just that they're allowed to do it. But it won't accept it until someone legitimately does that, right? <clears throat> and so it's a very easy to maintain security model because I'm not maintaining it at a thousand different touch points. I'm maintaining it at one spot. <clears throat> and I can do it at a, at a, at a template level. And I can put systems into, into groups and then I create roles and I can so that, that get those roles or users. I can have them come in from my Active Directory or my domain controller. I can bring in the, 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 the groups as roles from my domain controller. Make it easier to manage the system, you know, because and ninety percent of our systems out there use this group-based security, because, you know, I don't want to have to change my SCADA system every time somebody changes jobs, right? You know, I want the IT or HR to worry about that, right? What roles are they supposed to have? But now, as I begin to put this into the system, we invite computers to join your SCADA environment, right? And they all get certificates to say, you can join this SCADA environment. And this is the, the current, current foot, footprint. This computer here, you could put all of Wonderware software on it you want, or Viva software, or whatever, right? And it's not, nobody, it's, it can't play in the system. It can't write to anything. And then the security model is one that is distributed out to all players in this SCADA environment. Because you got to be able to support security even if these are the only two computers left operating, right? If everything else has been blown up or whatever, or shut down or whatever, these guys still have to be able to do secured actions, independent of maybe the... And so when a user logs in, right, gives her login, they'll get authenticated by the domain controller. But we'll bring those credentials back into the, oper into the workstation they logged in at. So now that user can log in and out of that workstation, even if the domain controller is unavailable, just like you can do with your laptop, right? I go to my laptop, I plug it into my corporate network, I log in, I can take it home, and I can log in as myself again, right? Same mechanism. But then we'll send a token of that user to everybody else with what they're allowed to do. So now, when the user goes to do something, He'll attempt to write to something. If you notice when the thing, the status of that went to a state called pending, which means it's saying, I'm attempting to write to something. He's going to validate who I am. And then once he validates it, he's going to send the value to the device and tell me that the write was successful. And if I have a verified write, he's going to do the same thing. The status goes to pending. He says, I, that's great. You're allowed to do me, but I demand you authenticate yourself. And he'll automatically pop up this dialog box and demand you get this additional authentication. You can even sign it and put some notes on it. <clears throat> and then verified right is basically going to demand two people, right? So that you can get that additional level of authorization. So now as we begin to build stuff out, right, the, this is sort of the generic layout of, of OT, IT integration with a DMZ in between. Um, As I look at uh, you know the device connectivity, these are very uns you know we're getting better at the device level, right? Schneider's doing a lot of work in here. Other vendors are doing a lot of work in here, right? But in the past, these have been very open environments. Basically, all you needed was a properly formatted message, right? And it says, "Oh, that's great, thank you." You know, <laughs> so this is your biggest. Uh, thing. So you should really restrict what's allowed to talk to these devices, right? Don't just allow anything to open up a IO server type connection and make a Modbus connection to this device, right? And sometimes you have to go to the point of having, you know, a network modeling environment where I can control with like Cisco makes a great product. Other people make good products for modeling this network access to these devices. So only this computer, which nobody can log into, can talk to my devices. And then, um, you know, that may involve many network topologies, right? 
uh, wired, fiber, wireless, cellular, radio, all kinds of things, right? Uh, Cisco used to make a product called Fluid Mesh. It's now um, called Ultra Reliable Wireless Backhaul. All right. Why they had to change the name? I don't know. Maybe they went to the Aviva School of Marketing. <laughs> but um, and then you know, so we have these objects in our system platform framework called device integration objects. They make the connection to the OI server, to the to the to the Kepware, right? They make the connection to that server, right? They everything they do can be secured. I can go, go to those things and say, disable all access to operate attributes. That means nobody can write to those things. Nobody can write to them directly, right? The only thing you can write to them is if you go through the application object, which I can put all that additional individual item security on, right? And so as you look at this whole process control network, and this is a little bit, a bit of a busy slide, but basically there's lots of task-oriented components here, right? You don't want to have SCADA A and SCADA B anymore. Right? You want to be able to task orient these operating systems. Give them a purpose and a function. Right? Virtualization is awesome for this. Right? I can sit there and create a virtual host and task orient these guys. Right? Most importantly is that this thing we call the system management server, you want that on its own little OS. Just isolate it, put it off to the side, let it do its job of managing your certificates. No one needs to ever get into it again. Right? We should be domain isolated from the business IT framework, right? Should have a firewall on top of there, right? All internode communications in this environment should be secured at rest and secured in motion. All access should be limited to that object model security because that's a security model I can defend against. Everything else is really non-defensible, right? And any outgoing communication must be originated from the OT framework, OT environment. I shouldn't allow anything to reach into this, my OT network and go and get stuff. And we'll talk about this after lunch. But like if I'm talking to you know, one of these devices like this, where does this live? This is a cloud device. And do I want to teach this cloud device how to get into my OT network through all my intrusion protection and then leave it at the bar at the hotel? Right? Is that a good policy? No. Right? Right? So teaching this to get into my OT framework is not a good idea. Leave this in the cloud. Let it access its data from the cloud. <clears throat> right? And so this is kind of a not thought of as part of security, but it's very much a part of security. Redundancy is very important from a security model. I have to be able to accept patches, updates, critical things, right? We're not perfect. You know, we can make a mistake and we have to fix it. But now you have to implement the fix, right? You saying I can't implement it till the Christmas shutdown is not a security policy, right? You should be able to accept administrative downtime into your system that doesn't induce downtime into your system, right? And redundancy is a very important part of this. You know, I've seen like customers like, oh, I have, you know, high availability on my servers. Well, great, that's a great practice. But what happens if you have to patch the OS? That high availability isn't gonna do anything for you, right? So you gotta be able to operate the system as through patches, right? And, and the Aviva redundancy in here is very, very complete, right? It takes care of all kinds of things. It'll it worry about, you know, installations of software components. It will make sure the, the, the all the software components are synchronized between the two. Um, alarms, data, calculations, uh, configuration changes, right? You know, nowhere, no longer do you have these two environments, SCADA A and SCADA B, and we've never touched SCADA B in 10 years, and we don't even know if it works or not, right? What's the rev that it's running, right? No, it manages all that completely for you, <clears throat> right? Because most downtime is not failure. Most downtime is administrative. You know, yeah, we got to protect against the possibility of failure, but we guarantee you that there will be administrative downtime that you have to deal with. If your redundancy system doesn't take care of that, then it's not doing you much good. And then as I get stuff out here, I should have a DMZ on top of this process control network, right? This is what my process control network talks to doesn't talk directly to the business network. It talks to the DMZ. 
And then I can put all these other interfaces that I want other people to use in the DMZ, right? They can get into the DMZ, they can't get into the process control network. And we'll talk more about this in the next, after lunch as we talk about it. how do we get through this, right? Because very a properly designed OT environment should not have on the other side of a single firewall the internet. There should be multiple firewalls. If you look, look at NERC SIP, they even say it should be two different firewalls made by two different vendors so that if someone breaks into one, you can protect against them getting all the way through, right? And I shouldn't just say, oh, well, I need to use some network path, so just run that through all my firewalls. Well, that's not a network strategy, right? Your firewall guys will look at you and say, what? All right, so <clears throat> the basic thing is that we need to have things controlled with certificates. We got to be able to isolate and know who is talking to who, right? And that's what certificates can do for us. And with all things should be authenticated, authorized, approved, and archived, right? And I should do that. And it should be enforced at the destination group command, completely independent of client configuration and protocol, right? If you want to pull up a, another vendor's HMI and plug it into your environment, it should still have to be required. And maybe it can't support the level of authentication and security that you're asking, then fine, it just can't modify those things, right? Doesn't mean you have to compromise yourself, right? And obviously, you know, it's securely engineered network segmentation, intrusion protection that we've talked about pre prior to this is all very, very important. But, uh, you know, Viva System Platform enables the defense required, right? Everything's TLS 1.2 encrypted. All user identification is transmitted with every right. Read path is independent to write to that. There's a guaranteed mechanism for delivery of commands. If not, it'll tell you, I couldn't get there. Graphic can be animated to reflect that. Um, it's one place to configure that also. I just go one place and I say, if I can't write to something, do this. And every graphic will do that. Changes will be logged by the right target into the historian in a write once log mechanism. And we have ability to safe and secure cloud integration through all the existing intrusion protection layers. We'll talk about that after, right? So defensible security in your OT environment from a practical perspective, right? 